I've always been a huge fan of mathematics. I enjoy math in school, and I've been performing a mental math stage show around the country for the last three years. Later, I'll be showing you guys one of the things I do in my show. The theme of this conference is improving the community, which is a great theme because of the diversity it brings with it. But in all of the endeavors we've seen to improve the community, the first thing to do was find where the community was weak. You need to find the weak spots and then fix them. America's a very lucky country because we don't have a lot of weak spots. Uh, in comparison to the rest of the world, we are one of the more fortunate nations. We are known across the globe for innovation in fields like science and technology. As a math enthusiast, I assume that this would show in our mathematics ranking in comparison to the rest of the world. I thought that we would at least be in the top 10. So it was pretty shocking for me the first time I heard that most studies rank us between 25th and 32nd. At school this last year, we received a four month long group research project where we had to identify a problem in America and figure out how to fix it. I was immediately reminded of America's low mathematics ranking, and so our group decided to figure out how to get us back to the top. From all of our research, we found a lot of things that can be improved in our math education. If you want to improve math education, it's natural to start by figuring out who the people are teaching it. It's impossible to draw conclusions about all teachers in the country, especially as a few eighth graders. However, we did find out about a study that compared the grades and SAT scores of teachers in different countries. We know the students aren't at par with each other, but what about the teachers? This study found that in high achieving countries, they had 100% of their teachers in the top third of their class. But in America, we only had 20% of our teachers in the top third and 47% in the bottom third. Clearly, lots of our teachers are not experts in math and you can't expect a student to be better at a subject than their teacher. Similarly, you can't expect a student to like a subject more than their teacher. If a teacher doesn't like a topic, it's gonna to come through in their teaching and the student won't like the topic as well. Let me show you an example of this. In school this last year, I was taking geometry and a big part of geometry is proofs. I find proofs fascinating because they are the reason why something is true. You might know that one plus two equals two plus one, but you can't say it definitively until you have a mathematical proof that it works. Let me tell you a little story about proofs just to give you an idea of what I'm referring to. In the year 19, or 1772, a Swiss mathematician by the name of Leonard Euler took the following equation. A to the fourth equals B to the fourth plus C to the fourth plus D to the fourth. So one number to the fourth power equaling the sum of three other numbers to the fourth power. He wanted to know if, you could, if there was a way to solve that equation by using all whole numbers, no fractions or decimals. For over 200 years, mathematicians worked on that problem and they could not find any solution. But they couldn't come up with a reason as to why it didn't work either. In science, if something seems to work every time, then it is generally accepted that it will work every time. But in mathematics, you need that proof to make sure that it works. Since they didn't have the proof, they kept looking for either a reason as to why it didn't work or a solution to make it work. Finally, in the year 1986, an American mathematician by the name of Noam Elkies found a solution to the equation. If A, B, C, and D equal those giant numbers right there, then the equation works. A couple of years later, he actually proved that there are an infinite number of solutions to that equation. The, uh, in mathematics, if you make any assumptions and you can wind up completely incorrect. When I originally learned about proofs, I learned it from people who really liked the topic and because of that were able to explain why they liked it in their explanation of it. So I grew to really like proofs, as I hope you could tell from that story. However, m my math teacher from this last year doesn't like proofs. She likes algebra, likes calculus, just isn't a fan of proofs. This last year, she had to teach proofs, meaning that she had, to, she had to teach proofs because she was teaching geometry. And since most of the kids in my class were learning the topic from her, they now don't like proofs either. <laughs> it's not the student's fault. It's not even the teacher's fault. We just can't have teachers teaching topics they don't like. It will end up rubbing off on the kids. Also, the current methods of teaching have been taken over by standardized testing. We heard before that when the No Child Left Behind Act was 
put in place in 2002, the goal was to use district and state testing to figure out which schools were scoring below proficient, figure out what wasn't working in those schools, and fix it. This sounds like a great idea on face, but it actually ended up backfiring. Schools could strategize to do as well as possible on the test, which would end up hurting the students. For example, most standardized tests separate their scores into proficient and below proficient. They generally go further to break it into advanced, proficient, basic, below basic, and far below basic, but the proficient category is the main one analyzed by the administrators, government, and real estate market. So, schools try to get as many kids above that proficient bar as they can. Let me show you what types of problems this can cause. Imagine an eighth grade classroom at the beginning of the year with three kids, we'll say an advanced student named Larry, an average student named Sally, and a below average student named Carl. Now, these scores might look a little low for their levels, but remember that this is the beginning of the year and they should be expected to improve. How would the teacher go about teaching this class? Well, since she's trying to get as many kids above the proficient bar as she can, she's going to try to get as many of them above as she can. So, uh, so since Larry is already above the proficient bar, she's not going to put much effort into working with him. Sally is below the bar, but definitely has the potential to get there, so she's going to put lots of time and energy into working with her to get her above the bar. Carl is below also, but seems like miles away from being proficient. He probably has the potential to get there, but isn't going to get the attention he needs because it wouldn't be in the best interest for the teacher. This is where no child left behind ends up leaving millions of children behind. Because of this, uh, Carl won't... Thank you. Uh, now, the fairest method to teach this class would undoubtedly be to teach Larry, Sally, and Carl equally but this would only get one student above the bar when teaching specifically to Sally would get two above the bar. Do teachers actually do this? Well, it's impossible to draw conclusions about every single teacher's teaching method. However, the TIMSS test, which is the test that ranks the countries in the world in mathematics, found that, uh, found that in America, only 7% of our students qualified as advanced. In Singapore, 48% qualify, and in South Korea, 47% qualify. Also, this test found that the average students in America score almost as well as the gifted ones. I think that is pretty good proof that the average students in America get catered to the most. Also, standardized, uh, another problem with standardized testing is that it narrows the school curriculum. If students since schools want to do well on the test, they're going to teach whatever is going to be on the test. If it is testing fractions and decimals, they will teach fractions and decimals. If it is testing area and perimeter, they will teach area and perimeter. But schools don't often go beyond what the test standards actually are. I wanted to see if this was actually true, so I compared the Common Core, the Connecticut Mastery Test Standards, which is the main standardized test in Connecticut, to the Common Core Mathematics Standards, which are the standards that most public schools in the country abide by. The Connecticut Mastery Test strictly covers arithmetic on whole numbers and fractions, geometry, measurement, data analysis, and algebraic reasoning. Now look at the Common Core Standards. As you can see, the, t uh, the curriculum strictly covers what is going to be on the test when there's lots else out there for students to learn. Also, there need to be improvements done to the curriculum itself. Our country has a 99% literacy rate, but just an 80% numeracy rate, which is the ability to handle simple arithmetic problems. In fact, students are not coming out of class with proper numeracy, creativity with numbers, or the ability to solve math problems most efficiently. A really fun way to teach all three of these things is to teach mental math. Many of the problems that students are asked to do on paper can be done much more easily in your head. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, first, I have a volunteer over here with a calculator, and they're going to check my work on this. Can someone give me a two-digit number? What was that? 42. 42, and another one? 73. Uh, 73. I'd like you to multiply 42 times 73 on the calculator, and you should get 3,066. Yes? Good. Now, for that problem, there is... Thank you. Uh, for, for that problem, there was not just one single method I could use. I had to choose how I wanted to solve the problem, which brings in creativity. 
For example, the problem 24 times 18 can be approached many ways. You can use the addition method where you break the 24 into 20 plus 4 and do 20 times 18 plus 4 times 18. This gives 360 plus 72, which is 432. You could also break the 18 into 10 plus 8. You can also use the subtraction method, where instead of breaking the 18 into 10 plus 8, you do 20 minus 2. 24 times 20 is 480, 24 times 2 is 48, and 480 minus 48 is 432. You can also use the factoring method, where you break the 18 into 9 times 2 and do 24 times 9 times 2. 24 times 9 is 216, times 2 is 432. You could also have broken the 18 into 6 times 3, or the 24 into 12 times 2, 8 times 3, or 6 times 4. You can also use the squaring method, where you use an algebraic identity to turn, uh, to turn the problem into 21 squared minus 3 squared. In many school districts, they demand their students to memorize the squares up through 25, so these students would know this is 441 minus 9, which again is 432. You can also use the close together method, which doesn't even show up there, where, uh, <laughs> you, use, uh, where you use Vedic mathematics to turn the problem into 20 times 22, minus, or yeah, 20 times 22 minus 2 times 4. This yields 440 minus 8, which again is 432. As you can see, there were 10 different ways that you could solve that single problem. Uh, to give students that kind of creativity would really improve the math minds of Americans. Also, uh, also there, uh, the curriculum needs to be more flexible. In, uh, earlier, we heard that the general school curriculum needs to be broadened to include the humanities, the arts, and physical education. But there also needs to be broadening in each specific discipline as well. The branches of mathematics have been described as islands of knowledge in a sea of ignorance. Calculus is an island, statistics is an island, game theory is an island, number theory is an island, graph theory is an island, and these are all floating out there individually. When schools say they teach math, they should mean that they give an overview of the concepts in this sea and attempt to build bridges between the different islands, connect together these diverse ideas. But what schools are actually doing is just taking their students and dumping them off on the calculus island. The American school curriculum strictly covers Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, Pre-Calculus, and Calculus. But how many of you guys use Calculus on a day-to-day -day basis? How many of you even remember Calculus from high school? Just a couple of you. The, general, the current way that we're teaching math is as if we're telling all high school students that they should all take a language when they're in high school. Oh yeah, and that language has to be French. Well, what if, you'd, what if you'd rather take Spanish or German or Italian or Chinese? This is what we're doing in mathematics. If we offer more electives, students will come away with a much better math education. The theme, or today, everyone here is interested in improving the community. And our community and our whole nation is in need of improvement in mathematics. Now, I'm only 14, so I can't do much about our nation's math education but I know that there are people out there in the education system who can. The fact that we are 32nd in math should be a wake-up call for us. We need to fix our teachers, standardized testing methods, and curriculum so that our country can go back to being one of the best in the world. Thank you.